Hey everybody, miserable weather isn't it? It's been absolutely biblical down here. Um, this at the moment is what I'm calling sort of like a, a break, although it's not actually stopped breaking. Um, you can see it's still sprinkling with rain down there. Had so much to do to this weekend as well. Uh, it's going to get me covers partially on. I was going to leave one section open, um, but as that involves a little bit of um, gaffer tape, masking tape, black nasty, whatever you want to call it, because um, it's peeing it down, um, not going to be able to do that. Uh, reasons I'm using gaffer tape will become clear when I do it. I will uh, video it all for you. But yeah, so um, outdoor stuff. Um, is off the cards this week. Um, still got to do my filter cleaner for normal. Um, there's an old saying going that there's no such thing as bad weather, only the wrong clothes. Yeah, obviously never had a koi pond to look after, the uh, person who said that. But hey ho. Um, yeah, so I picked up something uh, the other day. Um, well, I had it sent to me in the post, ordered uh, from the Wooden Koi Company, uh, Maggie Smeaton. I uh, decided to give myself one of the uh, Koi Flux. Um, I'll get it for you and show it to you in just a sec. So, yeah, there's the uh, Koi Pack I got from the Wooden Koi Company. Uh, looks a bit, a little bit familiar. Um, that's because. Well, they look very identical down to the spot down there. Before the sumi started changing, the extra sumi started coming through. But yeah, I've been meaning to get one for a while. And um, got a bit of bullet and uh, flicking through what um, stock ones you had when I saw this. And uh, so I ordered it and uh, she kept me informed throughout the process of how far along it was and when it was going to be sent very reasonable price um, you know a lot of lot of work goes into it and not bad quality at all so um, I'll post a link to the wooden koi company down below and uh, if you fancy one for your pond you can have a look through the stock images or if you feel like it and you've got one of your favourite koi, past or present, or something along those lines. You can send a photograph into Maggie, and she will do her best to replicate um, your koi. Um, various different designs, and fish at different angles. Um, or you can get them inside sort of little squares, little Japanese squares, little plaque type things. But I expect most of us have. Um, seen the work before uh, in various videos or on the websites and things like that but yeah pop along have a look Christmas is coming so drop a hint to your rubber halves or to your kiddies and uh, make a nice little uh, stocking filler for somebody anyway I'm gonna attempt to get this mounted now but weather allowing I'll see if I can get it done all right guys see you in a minute So, it's in by the place, doesn't look too bad does it? Yeah, quite chuffed with that. Uh, gonna have to take that off, um, cover up the back of the shower uh, when I put my covers on, uh, unless I do a bit of redesign. I was hoping to do it now, here comes the rain again, just dive back in. Yeah, so, uh, trying to get things done. Uh, but the weather keeps uh, changing like I said it doesn't totally stop it sort of like spits spits and then it just comes on quite heavy as it is at the moment now uh, managed to get the plaque on as you saw um, yeah like I said I'm gonna maybe have to take the front the sort of like the rising sun uh, that goes around the back of shower because uh, I've got covers that go around the back of shower in winter um, just to keep it so I can keep it working keep it going throughout winter 
some people turn them off um, some people keep them going um, but if you keep them going it's better to cover them as I said last week I think it was uh, I said it's um, a very fast way to cool down your uh, water is um, a backy shower it's, as I said the cold gets to them quite quick and with the blade coming out the back the spillway water spinning through it picked up the cold air cools your water down very fast plus it trickling down the box but if you can put a cover on it keeps the heat in anyway i'm gonna have a little talk about well i'm gonna have to change the plans like i said i was gonna have a whole lot to do this weekend uh, hopefully i'll be able to get in next weekend so just have a little talk about rainwater and the rain and what it can do to your pond uh, let's get inside get a cup of tea and we'll talk about that in a minute So yeah, as most of the country knows, um, this weekend, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, uh, it's literally only just stopped raining outside now, uh, after nearly three days solid, um, rainwater. Now, it's to us koi keepers, is it a benefit or is it a hazard? Um, yep. Yeah change your clothes change your location yeah i was just uh looking at what i recorded uh yesterday um wasn't too happy with it so re-recording so if you think the con continuity has gone a bit funny uh, that's why i'm just uh just uh re-recording so talking about rainwater uh rainfall and the effects it can have on your pond now we all know how the rain is um, formed, water on the ground, whether it be sort of like after a rainfall it's on the pavements or in your ponds or your lakes and that lot. Sun comes out, warms things up, it evaporates into a gas. Gas is lighter in the air so it lifts itself up, up into the sky where it starts to cool down cools down so it forms uh, clouds and then as it cools down even further it reforms into um, liquids into droplets and then these droplets fall to the ground as rain um, if there was no cars factories agriculture where you're putting chemicals into onto the fields and everything like that rainwater would be at the purest form of uh, H2O it would be ideal sort of like water it's what you could recreate I don't know whether you've done the experiments at school where you do sort of like evaporation you know the old Bunsen burner with the tube of water in it to early glass vial and then uh, another beaker at the end of it where you evaporate the water and it travel around and then reform into the beaker sort of you'd have sort of like salt in the first jar and then what would end up in the other jar would be you know saltless water normal water <laughs> but so yeah well that's how rainwater falls um and in today's society where we're all being metered and things um rainwater harvesting is becoming more and more popular um, even on the household side of things you can now get um, obviously at cost uh, big 6,000 10,000 litre tanks buried into the ground and then you collect and harvest all the rainwater off your building off your sheds and run off everything it all goes into this tank small filter on it and then it's pumped back into your house for flushing of your toilets or of washing your clothes. Obviously, it's not for drinking uh, or any of the things where it's going to go into your body. But for, like I said, for flushing your toilets and for um, washing your clothes, you can it all be linked up uh, into your water system of the house. Obviously, because you have droughts and things in summer, um, you still need to have you know, your mains that sort of like can kick in if there's no water in these barrels so why can't we use this as a, a free economical top up for our ponds um, first and main main point really is we all know about pH 
and we all know where our pH roughly needs to be, which is around about 7, 7.5, um, to keep our koi happy. And not all of us can hit that, you know, I'm 8.3. Uh, it's not, well, 8.2, 8.3. It's not ideal, but it's not nasty for them. It's, it's within the acceptable limits. Now, rain, when it falls, has a, a pH of around about 5 to 6. Does vary a little bit. Um, but this is, we're talking about pure rain now, so it's five to six. So if you just fill your pond up and you keep topping your pond up uh, with rainwater, then obviously the pH is going to crash, and your koi ain't going to like it, and they're going to get ill and blah 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 blah. So that's the first reason why rainwater is no good. The second reason is is in today's society. Uh, cars, vehicles, on the road, everywhere you go, factories, big production units, bellowing out sort of all sorts of junk through their chimneys, up into the sky, you know, farming, pollutants, you know, uh, insecticides and everything like that being sprayed onto the fields. All these can affect rainwater. Some of this can, during the evaporation stage, can actually be picked up and evaporated uh, along with your water at the same time and taken up and it's already up there in the atmosphere so when it falls it's falling with the droplets but big factories where they're billowing out god knows what out their chimneys um, all sorts of sulfates sodiums and stuff like that can be as the rain falls the gases mix with the droplets of water and gets contained and then it's brought to earth and this can actually lower um, the pH of rainwater even more down to sort of like four or even below hence the term uh, acid rain which we've all heard of um, and so the pH value is lowered and also then you've got to think about the toxicity it's not in huge levels in our country we're quite lucky but um, Nigeria back in it's 2008 uh, they do a lot of, um, they have a lot of gas wells and the standard thing is, you know, when you're drilling for gas you see the towers, they've got the big flames burning off and that lot of them. and that was banned by the Nigerian government where they're constantly burning it, the glass, glass flaring it's called um, that was banned because uh, livestock uh, was and fish stops were dying um, in vast numbers um, when they carried out the research they found that the watercourses had been um, poisoned with lead and it was discovered that the lead was coming from the gas flaring and obviously going up into the atmosphere being brought down into the when it rained bring and bring down into the watercourses and it, <laughs> the lead was at deadly levels um, Chernobyl where we all heard about Chernobyl, some of us might have even watched the series on telly sort of thing just recently, but how many people know that South Wales was affected? Um, the fallout, obviously, big bellowing smoke and that lot, affected uh, the clouds, the rainwater in the clouds that actually came across to South Wales um, when it rained, um, there was contamination uh, and it affected us well quite a big area of South Wales and the government actually banned any lambing in that area for several years simply because of the toxic fallout the nuclear fallout that had come over in the clouds into the rainwater you know on a lower scale um, any of you who live up Essex up uh, and um, Brentford way or anything like that will um, commonly know that sometimes when it rains you come out and your car's covered in sand um, this is the sand is actually picked up from the Sahara brought across into clouds with rainwater and when it rains it's just that part of the area you know just for some reason it just sort of seems to be over Essex Brentford way and that lot and it comes down and you've got sand all the way from the Sahara falling on your, on your cars so you know you can appreciate all the sort of stuff that can be picked up and fall into your ponds um, now 
I live in a hard water area, um, luckily. So when rain falls into my pond, I've got enough KH to buffer any pH swings. Contaminants or anything like that, there's not a lot I can do about that. Yes, I could put a cover over. I mean, that's one of the answers to it. Um, putting a cover over, I'd like to, but it's not possible. Um, I have trickle in, trickle out. So I can actually keep, you know, changing out any rainwater and hopefully any pollutants that do fall into my water, I can flush out pretty quickly that way. But if you live in a soft water area, um, sort of like parts of Devon, uh, places like that, where the, the water is really soft, um, it's something you need to keep an eye on um because rainwater can really really affect your ponds quite badly i know there's going to people there's going to be people out there saying well you know i've had a pond for five thousand years and you know it's never affecting my pond uh, great i'm not saying it is i'm just saying it's something that you know as koi keepers we need to be aware of and understand what can happen so if you do see your fish behaving oddly after sort of like a you know a week of storms or a week of rain or something like that at least you can go ah wait a minute could it be and then you can check your water ph values you know just make sure there ain't no contaminants or anything like that in your water like i said you can cover trickle in trickle out and like i said if you're in a hard water area not a problem but in soft water areas please be aware of it all right guys i know it's not one of these things that's explained we all know about it but it's not talked about very often so i just thought i'd raise it especially after the weather we've been having this weekend and uh moving on back to my original clothes i'm going to talk about the future of koi food see you in a minute another thing to think about and i'm going to start hopefully start a bit of a debate about this um koi food now i'm not going to talk about what's normally talked about this time of year swap, swapping over to your winter feed be it a wheat germ or an all season food or anything like that what i want to touch on and want to get people's opinions on and get people thinking about is the future of koi food now the world's changing um whether you believe in global warming or anything like that, you know, there's no doubt about it that the world is changing. Certain stocks that planet Earth provides um, are running out or getting low and restrictions are being placed on the amount that we can use by various governments around the world. And one of them being fish. Uh, fish stocks and what they used to be, there's been a lot of overfishing. We've all seen it on the on the news and stuff like that. And, you know, as well as other things like meat, um, they're on, you know, they're trying to cut down on cattle and sheep and everything like that. Not, not because we're running out of meat, but because cows produce methane. <laughs> you know, we all produce a bit of methane every now and again. <laughs> um, but uh, cows are being blamed for sort of like, you know, a bit of global warming because of the sheer numbers of them in breeding and stuff like that so they're looking to alternatives for meat and one of the alternatives um is insects yeah i know <laughs> um i personally have eaten a few insects in the past um that's better i personally have eaten a few insects in the past they've uh it's interesting, I mean, but they've not been mixed with anything. I've, I've, eat, I've eaten crickets, uh, which they grew up, um, and I've squeezed the honey from honey ants, uh, mealworms, I've eaten them as well. You know, not top of my list uh, for eating them raw, but certain experts, and it's a growing trend, um, are believing that uh, insects are going to be the food of the future. Um, for us, the human race, uh, eventually. But what's already creeping onto the market, and it's starting to take off uh, big time, is um, insect-based pet foods. 
uh, it's already hitting the dog food and the cat food market and whether it's being on trend you know being the latest fashion and everything like that it's starting to take off um, you know people are buying it um, like I said it's extremely high in protein um, so you can get your protein base and then sort of like obviously mixing it with other things to get your fully balanced diet but cutting out the meat altogether now this is going to be the future of koi food or it's believed that it will be the future of koi food and it was tried years back um, bringing in insect base uh, you know insect meal instead of fish meal into the koi foods and it flunked big time people just didn't uptake with it they just didn't weren't interested no it's got to be fish meal based um, that's the koi food that's the way it is why if we look at say the common carp um, which is where our koi all sort of like derive from um, the omnivores uh, they go around they cruise around the edges of a big lake eating vegetation you know coming up to the surface taking great big chunks out of the plants <coughs> excuse me no it's not corona they take um you know great big chunks out of the plants and then they dive down deep and they root around the bottom of the lake um finding small crustaceans insects you know insect larvae beetles you name it whatever they can find rooting around down there they eat and any of you fishermen out there will know sort of like on a nice warm summer's evening when you've been out car fishing not getting a bite of you know you've been sat there for hours you haven't had a single run and they mayflies and all that lot start to dabble around on the water and all of a sudden you just see this great big pair of lips just come up and just <laughs> suck a mayfly and then disappear into the depths so our koi they come you know from carp now we all know about the japanese mud ponds how you know a lot of the koi are put out in the japanese mud ponds big vast expanses of water again full of natural life small crustaceans insects you know shrimp all sorts of things so why is there such an opposition to having insect based koi food you know yes if it was just pure insects like um i'm trying to think it's the soldier soldier fly larvae you can buy sort of like something where it's just 100 percent that and you feed it to your fish we all feed our fish treats like mealworm um river shrimp um silkworm pupae just as treats extremely high in protein you know good for the skin quality and everything like that but the same as the normal koi food that we have now we um the koi food of the future the insect based koi food will not just be insects all insects based will be replacing is the fish meal it will be insect meal instead of fish meal and then all the other bits and pieces that are added to the koi food will be added to the insect meal now it's a natural source of protein as well it's, it's it can be very high in protein um well extremely high in protein we know it is so you know it's something i think that we as koi keepers will have to get our heads around and accept as it comes onto the market now i believe copins are doing an insect meal based koi food at the moment um i'm not sure on how popular it is if anybody out there uses it um if if you are using it um uh, you know let me know let me know what you think of it let me know how you how your koi are doing on it but this just because of the way um planet earth is going and the way we're dealing with things uh it will not be long before fish meal uh, koi food will start to 
a become very expensive then b start to disappear and i think insect mail will actually take over whether manufacturers want it to happen or not or whether we as koi keepers want it to happen or not uh, it will be something that will be forced upon us and i don't think it's too far into the distant future when that's going to happen so good idea bad idea will you um you know will you try it if you see it appear on the market from a well-known brand obviously you know um or will you just you know dig your heels in poo poo it all together and not accept it let's start the debate let's see what happens all right guys so not a lot this week um like i said weather has just been totally miserable so hopefully next week and um it's gonna be a lot better got a lot to do uh but i'll keep that till next week there's a lot of stuff going on that i need to get doing winter prep and everything like that i'll probably be one of the last getting the covers on because uh, this but i'm trying to hold off anyway uh, water staying stable so okay people stay safe look after yourselves and enjoy life all right guys take care bye